when you work out your equations or your program, it is following a set of steps and it has to be done correctly. It has to be true. It's not like I can use better words than you and get judged subjectively on my words. Objective decisions. When you develop a product, it has to work or not work. That is an element of truth. And I decided engineers were the finest people in the world in my mind. <coughs> when I, before Apple, I was working at Hewlett Packard. Back then, Hewlett Packard only made test equipment with dials and knobs and voltages, things that engineers used. And I, since I was helping design these products, the handheld scientific calculators, I was an engineer designing products that engineers used. And we engineers at Hewlett Packard were partly marketing because we knew what was good or bad in engineering equipment. And I decided I am going to be, I'm an engineer's engineer, but I am going to be an engineer for the rest of my life. I will never move up in management because it gets kind of political where you take sides and you're, you don't necessarily be truthful about things where like an engineer has to. I'll be an engineer for life, and I told everyone that. I will be an engineer at Hewlett Packard for the rest of my life. And it was the hardest decision to form Apple. <coughs> so being recognized for engineering, when I developed the Apple II computer, this is the product, the only money-making product that Apple had for the first 10 years of the company. It's the only successful product. This computer was so far ahead of its time. Um, it brought the world from black and white to color. In a, in a computer, in a low-cost computer. But more than that, I was interested in fun and humor in my life. Games. I had developed games digitally for myself and for Atari. A typical arcade game. Atari was forming a new industry called arcade games. Atari in Los Gatos, California, where I live now. And the, their games were typically 150 chips, 1,000 wires that an engineer like myself had to hook up to make sure all the signals were going up and down on the wires at the right time to show up as paddles and balls and a game on a TV set. But the Apple II computer that I developed was the first time ever that arcade games <coughs> for the masses became color. We moved from black and white to color. All the Atari arcade games in bowling alleys and the like were black and white TVs mm -hmm. because color was very expensive and hard to do. Um, but all, more than that, the Apple II computer that we call a computer, but it was really an incredible game machine, arcade machine, was the first time ever that arcade games were software. Mm -hmm. You're not the first time ever if you have a lot of money and research projects, right. but for the masses, for a real product. Yep. First time ever arcade games were software. A nine-year-old could sit down with a simple programming language, basic and write a game with moving pieces on a screen, a decent game, in one day, rather than an engineer hooking up a 1,000 wires over six months to get things right. This was a huge, huge step forward. So um, I didn't do it, but did I do this stuff to start a company? No. I never thought about it. Didn't want money. I didn't want to ever be super wealthy or anything. Didn't really want that, and I didn't want the politics of running a company, of managing one. I turned down the big money for Apple for, at first because I didn't want to run a company, and I only accepted it once it was clear I could be an engineer and nothing more. And, uh, and so, um, so here we were. So I, what I wanted was not, I did want to bring in my great computer to the world, but I built it for myself. It was the product I wanted, just like Elon Musk wanted a large electric car for his large family. He wanted supercharger stations so he could drive from his home in Southern California to the factory in Northern California. When you develop products for yourself, they often turn out great. Mm -hmm. And even Jobs and the iPhone is an example. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but I wanted this for myself. And, and I wanted what I wanted when we started Apple and started getting noticed and publicized my Apple II computer. Everything was open source and the schematics and, and, the, um, and the circuits were published because I wanted people to see my work. I wanted other engineers to see it. I wanted engineers to come up and say, wow, how did you come up with these things that are so different than in a book? For example, in a book we had learned in analog engineering how to design with op amps and feedback circuits, differential calculus, how to design, I was an analog engineer, how to design color 
into a TV, how to mix the red, blue, and green components and, um, and take all that into account. It was a long, long, difficult, expensive process. Maybe it cost $5,000 to put color on your TV. And I figured out, for some reason, a weird idea pops in my head or whatever. This was kind of how I worked. I accepted weird ideas. That if you took a number in a computer, the ones and zeros, the number six, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, put it on the wire into the TV, the right speed, every tele color television in existence would think it was color. Never in a book, never in an engineering book. Not even valid, not legal, not the way mathematics design color television, but it worked. It was just something that nobody else really saw. And, and so it's those sort of, I wanted people to look at my designs and say, whoa, where did he come up with those ideas? I was like in a 10 year period of magic coming out of me. And um, I also wanted them to look at my code and say, oh my gosh, how did he do that? The code of this product, which was Apple computer, all of its revenues for the first 10 years of the company, this was, was our only successful product making money. Mm -hmm. The Apple II computer, all of the code filled a binder about two inches thick. I had no money. I had no bank accounts. I could not afford a timeshare system where you sat down on a terminal and typed in a program and it calculated the ones and zeros that would go in your computer to run that program. I couldn't afford it. So I wrote my program on the right side of a sheet of paper, and then I used little, little cards to figure out what the ones and zeros would be and what the references and addresses and things would be, and I wrote all the ones and zeros in hexadecimal on the left side of the pages, two inches thick in a binder, and then I typed those numbers in. Hexadecimal, 40 minutes in a row I could type in, you know, 4K worth, 4K bytes almost. Basic language and a lot more. This was, who ever heard of that? So what was your throughput, you think? Anyway, my throughput. Yeah, you're, yeah. How many pages per? I don't know, when you're doing it yourself, you're all motivated. You're so <laughs> motivated, which I was. I, I had to have this, a lot of that software was basic. Yeah. Writing a language basic. I'd never even programmed in basic. This is the way a good engineer should think. You don't have to know it already from a course at the university. You don't have to know it from a yep. book. You just have to know how to create things and write your own book and do it very, very proficiently. Mm -hmm. So um, I knew that basic was the language we needed. I had only programmed in the scientific languages of the day. Fortran, Algol, PL1. Yeah. Basic was a kid's language, but I could sniff the air. If people were gonna buy computers in the home, if they were gonna want a computer in the home, it had to play games, and there was a book out, 101 games in basic. Mm. So I went into Hewlett Packard late at night and opened up the basic manual, and I started writing notes as to what the language was, and then I figured out how do you write a language, an interpreter, um, just, from, just from scratch, and the best things I ever did happened for two reasons. A, because I had no money and had to make it affordable, and B, because I'd sit down never having done these things, never having worked with a microprocessor before, never with dynamic memory, never, never with basic, never with any disk drive hardware or software, did the floppy disk in two weeks just so I could get to Las Vegas for the Consumer Electronics <laughs> Show. They were gonna let Apple in. We were only gonna send three people from Apple, right. marketing guys, you know, and I'm too shy to raise my hand and say, say, you know, well, gosh, I'm a founder of the company. Don't I get to go to Las Vegas? I want to see the lights of Las Vegas. <laughs> and, and, and I said, I don't know why I did this. I stuck my hand up in the staff meeting. There were five of us that really ran the company the first couple of years, and we were one year in. We didn't have Bob, Bob's VisiCalc yet. Mm -hmm. There's a spreadsheet that was going to make, make the whole market successful. But we needed a f <laughs> disk so you could say, run VisiCalc rather than have to pull a cassette tape out and that says VisiCalc on it, read it in with a cassette tape player. Huge difference going to a disc. So I raised my hand in the staff meeting and I said, if we have a floppy disk, can we show it? And Mike Markle, who ran the company, he was the adult that taught Steve and I how you set up a technology company. He said, yes, and my wheels are spinning. If I can develop a floppy disk controller and the software where you can type run a program and it runs, if I can do that in two weeks, I get to go to Las Vegas, they'll have to take me. They won't have a choice. <laughs> and that was, I worked every day, Christmas, New Year's, man, turned out this incredible design, but I didn't know how flop out disk drives were done, how any disk material was done. I just sort of knew it was writing on mag magnetic, I analyzed some schematics, I got down there and built mine up, and it was just eight little $1 chips. 
you know, and and, uh, and I just, um, I don't know. Those, like I said, magic can happen when you're an engineer. And it wasn't just a conventional floppy drive. Wasn't that a variable speed floppy to maximize the density? Oh, that was later on. Well, that was later. Okay. That was later on. Okay. Yeah. But um, it was pretty interesting. It was just a whole different mixture of, you don't put everything necessarily on a floppy disk controller. You share some software of the host computer. You don't just write to it through a serial cable and let it figure out what to do with files and all that. No. And that allowed us to write software on our host computer, the Apple II computer, to increase the density and increase the speed, increase the capacity of our floppy disks. I mean, it was just like almost unheard of stuff. And it also allowed things to be done so optimally with the very, very fewest low-cost parts by sharing the right amounts of the task with software anyway. Anyway, I'm just proud of the engineer. I wanted other engineers to always come up to me, and they did. And they did, especially ones who understood what, how it changed the world at that time. Our first logo at Apple was six colors. And our name was not Apple. It was Apple Computer. We were, it was a little different than today's Apple. Today's Apple understands people, lifestyle, needs. We're very flexible and moving around as to what they are. And Steve Jobs never understood computers, hardware, or software. So, of course, he was successful with the iPod. He understood people. So, and that was the, the great things that happened to us. As far as computers go, Steve Jobs' distance from cube computers aided the world a lot in the end. He failed with the products he tried to build that were computers, but he had this vision of the one time he'd ever used a computer. In high school, same high school I went to, but four years later, they had a terminal where you could connect over time sharing and type in basic programs. A terminal was a printer and a keyboard, and the computers were way out there somewhere. And he had this vision when the internet came that Everything, even programs were going to software was going to be out there. And that's the way it went because bandwidth increased on landlines and bandwidth increased. Cellular came, cellular bandwidth. Uh, so that's really the way we, that got us to where we are today with our small handheld products that do all the Internet stuff. You know, one thing I was just thinking about, too, is that uh, in Silicon Valley, you know, in the Santa Clara Valley where you were, um, about the time you were doing the Apple, uh, the Apple One, there was actually a, the Homebrew Computer Club, for example. There was kind of like... Um, and it's like anybody wants to create an innovative environment. It's kind of like, I think it was an inspiration to a lot of people, including you. Yeah. Well, the app, yeah, we had a homebrew computer club, yeah. and it was a whole bunch of geeks, yep. pure out and out geeks, that somehow had this idea that <coughs> if we could afford our own computers, we could do more than ever. We could communicate better, social benefits. We could educate better. The geek would be important at work where he could write in his own programs, he or she. And this club of about 200 people, the big computer company said, no, no, no. Never going to be any money. This thing's not going to go very far. And they weren't into it. Hewlett Packard turned me down five times. I wanted them to build the personal computer. But they just didn't see it as, as a business at that time. So the vice president signed it off. Every Hewlett Packard division signed it off. And Steve Jobs and I had to go into business. And I forgot what I started to say. So oh, I was just asking you about, you know, creating an environment that inspires people to do stuff. Well, inspire stuff. Well, I always wanted to be a teacher, inspire others, and make life fun. And that's a real key to learning. So that's a different ask, different question. My voice is holding out. I could still whisper if I have to. Okay. Um, what do you think are the most, in, in your view, some of the most important uh, uh, moments in the history of technology? Moments in the history of technology. Well, technology is a vague term. It is. What if you said a hammer, yep. a wheel? You could yep. go through thousands and thousands, you know, a nail. Um, but I think we're talking kind of towards electronics technology yep. and some of the very, very important things. I mean, obviously, airplanes and cars are important too, be they electronic or not. But go back to radio. And every when I'm in Florence, Italy, I go to this one church and there, right next to Galileo's tomb, is Marconi's, Marconi of radio. And I grew up with a ham radio license and 10 years old, and so important to me, protecting the waves and the mathematics behind it. So radio was a big thing because it led to, radio was a technology that led to radios that we use. And we hear music on anytime. Television obviously is another follow-on. Moving to color television was a huge technology step. 
other people that are interested in different things might say radar was a huge technology step in my very, very youngest days. Um, computers had long history of many steps. And in recent times, um, the, I'd say computers were getting smaller and smaller. Moore's Law. Where does Moore's Law come from? The transistor. Okay, Gordon Moore, uh, I'm sorry, not Gordon Moore, um, William Shockley. William Shockley was one of the inventors of the transistor and moved from the East Coast to Mountain View, California, Silicon Valley, to start a company to build an expensive transistor that would revolutionize phone companies all over the world. And he hired a lot of engineers, and they learned the technology and worked with one transistor was all they could make on a chip, one transistor. And they, could, they didn't succeed, so a lot of the engineers left. They formed a company called Fairchild to build a simpler type of transistor, the normal type. Mm -hmm. And it was very successful, but then they figured out how to make chips. And the huge step that made chips, this was another step. Because my life started with vacuum tubes. Yep. Then I saw transistors and I built projects in elementary school science fair projects <laughs> with hundreds of transistors. Never lose tic-tac-toe. Add and subtract digital numbers. And, and then came transistors, but then came the first chips. Chip might have a, like a little six transistors on it. One little gate, logic gate. And they're very simple at first. But what made chips work? There were two Nobel Prizes. I'm sorry, not Nobel Prizes. Um, two, yeah, two Nobel Prizes for inventing the chip. One was a design out in Texas by, nice. oh gosh. Yeah, no, he No, no, no. What? Kilby. Kilby, oh yeah. Jack yeah. Kilby. Jack Kilby. By Jack Kilby, yeah. yeah. I met him and he was a true engineer. And this was kind of an analog device, but out in Silicon Valley, um, Gordon Moore and Bob Noyce came up with this technique uh, and really a guy you've never heard of, Jean Herney, mm. deserves a lot of the credit for the planar method, the method of taking photographs and etching photoresist and putting etching step by step and implanting impurities into silicon or germanium Processing. to make more than one transistor on a chip. When I was about seven to nine years old, that young, I went to a show in San Francisco called Westcon. And in that show, a man held up a little design that looked like a bunch of buildings and roads. And the early chips, though, were so expensive, you couldn't afford them. They weren't 25 cents. Only the military could. There was a space race. The Russians had launched the first man to space and into orbit, and we had to catch up somehow. And then we had to get to the moon. And in those days, every little gram that you added to the weight that you were lifting with a rocket was incredibly expensive. So to save weight, you could have six transistors on one chip and save weight. And that was really one of the impetus. There was a company in Silicon Valley, Lockheed Martin in Sunnyvale, that would buy a lot of the early chips and allow this industry to be accelerated in, its, in how it progressed. Okay, so these were, um, those were all steps. Now, personal computers came along. I mean, there were a lot of steps I'm, I'm skipping, no doubt. But personal computers came along, and it was... Computers could be owned by a person. That was a big step, actually. And eventually from there, we, of course, we expanded memory, and eventually disks, disks of certain type, hard disks, mm -hmm. came to human being pricing. Mm -hmm. You could store an awful lot in your little machine. Now, when we started Apple, the amount of memory, RAM memory, that would hold one song cost the better part of a million dollars. Did we foresee the day that you'd have a thousand songs on an iPod? <laughs> you know, it, you don't know how far Moore's Law is going to go mm -hmm. before it stops, before it hits a limit. You just don't know these things. So it's all guesswork. Um, but obviously we got to the point that we could now have music mm -hmm. on devices. Now I've skipped a lot of things like hi-fis and all that that were involved with music and, and different types of speaker technology and whatever that were very important. but directly in my life, we got up to the, um, the iPod. Oh, before the iPod, though, our computers were command line computers. You would right. memorize what to type to get things done. And along came Xerox Park. Mm -hmm. And then Apple decided to build a Lisa computer based on mouse-based technology. 
the GUI, the graphic user interface, the, the windows that would open and menus that you could click buttons to bring up from familiar words how to do things. And our philosophy at Apple was make things easier than they ever were for somebody who's never been around computers, who is not a computer expert. Make it for the rest of us. And just have little suggestions. If an icon looks like a paintbrush, what does it do? It paints. So, um, so we came up with the Lisa computer and that was a big step, the mouse-based computer, the Macintosh eventually came. It was a horrible financial disaster for Apple. Mm -hmm. There was no software for it yet. No businesses would buy it, and that's where the market was. And we had to take three years to work on getting software and, and developing a market for the Macintosh. Its sales were like 500 units a month. Our stock dropped in almost half in a week. You're in a big company, and your stock drops almost half in a week. It's like scary stuff. Yeah. But, um, but the Macintosh was still the future, and we believed in it. I believed in it. Our CEO, John Scully, believed it was the future. It's just the steps to get to the future were different than Steve Jobs wanted it for a different purpose, which was to make himself known as the, as the most important person in the world. He always wanted to be one of those important people. Yeah. He was. He had the vision but he didn't really have the uh, operation skills to realize what was needed to make the Macintosh a, enough of a product to pay for itself. Okay, that was a step. Now we get to the iPod. And there were a lot of people trying to build little MP3 machines in those days. You could buy MP3 software for your Macintosh or for your, your DOS machine or your Windows machine. You could buy these little MP3 players and play songs. I love things smaller, smaller, less money, smaller footprint and all that. And look, sought the small ones all over the world. I like to go to Japan to see the new products coming up. And I found a little one from a United States company, the Diamond Reel 500. You could take a little smart card made for taking pictures on phones. And it could only hold two to four songs. Two to four songs per card. And you could plug them into this machine. Now you'd have two to four songs. Unplug it, plug another two to four songs in. To get enough songs to go across the country on an airplane cost about $1,000. Okay, but it was possible to do it with pure electronics, not a moving disc. Well, the iPod came out and actually used a new little one-inch disc. and, and 128-inch you know, thing, wasn't it? Oh, one, and then the one-inch. Yeah. One-inch, one in one point something. It was one not quite one-inch. Inch. But one disc, and that could hold the 1,000 songs. What a beautiful device that was. I played with mini disc recorders. All the music devices there were were a part of my life. And when the iPod came out, I don't judge things just because it's from Apple. It's got to be good. Mm -hmm. I try it. I use it. I get personal experience. Every bit of technology to this day, I like to buy things, even other brands than Apple, even other phones, and try them and use them and get to know what other people are doing. That iPod just took me over in just like an hour of using it. This was my music machine for life. And then came the iPhone. And who could ever imagine a phone without the buttons? Just a screen. Mm -hmm. Technically, from an engineering viewpoint, it's actually economical when you don't have to build extra mechanical devices. And it's pure electronic, getting away from mechanics. That's what I liked about the music players that had little cards, and you know, which is what we go by today. Little cards of Dan Flash memory. So uh, what were the steps? I don't know. We got up to the iPhone, obviously. We've made it. Things got small. Oh, the internet came. I forgot cellular uh, phones, connection. too. Yeah. Cellular phones came. The internet came. Mm -hmm. Cellular phones found a way to get data. Bandwidth came. And then everybody, then the internet came, and everyone was dialing up to get on the internet. Man, I loved it because where I lived, you could never get a phone number. I was interested in repeating digit phone numbers. You could never get a phone number, a seven-digit United States phone number, in the 408 area code that was... All seven digits the same. Two, 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 two. Three, 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 three. And I wanted these. I had lots of ones with six digits the same. I was collecting numbers. But you couldn't get them because area code 408, San Jose, way down to Monterey. Area code 415, Los Altos up through San Francisco. They didn't share any phone numbers between those two area codes. But the Internet came. <coughs> Everybody started getting extra phone lines in their home to be on the Internet. And they ran out of numbers. They started sharing them. So eventually I was able to get the number of my life, 888-888. And I found that I couldn't use it. 100 babies a day were pushing 
<laughs> and they were babies that could not talk. They, they could not talk or listen to what you said. You go, Mama, Mama, Mama. You couldn't get to a mother. Um, but 100 calls a day, and that's all it was. So, um, so I couldn't really use the, that phone number for a long time <laughs> until we got 10-digit dialing in the Air 408 area code. Or I, I eventually found a little service on the Internet that says press 1 for Steve, press 2 for Janet. The babies can't do that. Mm. I had another phone number that was interesting, 2345678. Engineers like to do these sort of things, you know, just mm -hmm. no reason. There's no money. There's no business. 2345678. And I got a lot of calls every day, dozens of calls every day. They were from slightly older infants that could barely talk. They could say their name. They were learning to count. <laughs> so cute. Yeah. So um, let's see. And other, yeah, I had one number, 2211111. You remember the old rotary dial phones, any yep. of you? Yep. The shortest, just a, <coughs> the number that was the quickest to dial was one. The next was two. Mm -hmm. There's only, it was only one legally assignable number in the United States, seven digit phone number, that had two twos and the rest ones. 2211111. No other way. To, that was the shortest. And I got it in my area code. And the f I had a lot of calls every day on that phone, and somebody would be hanging up. Well, I, I, I carried, you know, paper flight guides. I like to be very self-sufficient when I can. And I, was, oh, I would turn my flight guides. I would book my own flights. I called the airlines, and Pan Am had 800 2211111. Aha, numbers catch my attention always. Mm. So I said, maybe some of those calls are from Pan Am. The next time the phone rang, I heard someone hanging up, and I said, are you calling Pan Am? And she said, yeah. And I said, oh, we were on our lunch break. What can I do for you? <laughs> Being able to think on the fly and ad-lib these little jokes for wrong numbers, I mean, I wound up, so I booked my first phony flight that day. And then over the next couple of weeks, I just started going further and further. I said, well, if you want to cut your fare, you go through our grasshopper special. You fly up to Billings, Montana, down to Amarillo, Texas, up to uh, Moscow, Idaho. They, they don't even have airports in some of these places, I'm sure. But I said it cuts your fare to go through our lesser used airports, and they would believe me. They had thought they'd called Pan Am. They believed me. I answered every call for the next two years. Pan Am, international desk, Greg speaking. My friends would say, Steve, Steve, it's me. Do you think that's why they went bankrupt? But, no, no, no. I would have gotten caught. Somebody would have realized what number they called. I would get caught by the police and arrested. So at the end of booking the phoniest flights I could think of, I would tell them, you, fly to, you take our gambler special. What's that? You fly to Las Vegas, and then you roll the dice, and if you get a seven, the next leg is free. They would be able to believe it. So, so anyway, um, I had a lot of fun with those numbers, but at the end of the call, I would say I'm a prank, prankster. This is a prank. I'm not really Pan Am. Oh, good, good. You know, so, that, so I wouldn't get arrested. <laughs> Somehow I just always stayed on the, the safe side of the fence, barely. So, I don't know where we were. Well, we were in a number of places, it sounds like. But uh, I had a question for you. You know, because we've got a bunch of engineers and technologists in the room here. When you were doing the Apple One or any of the creative stuff you did, what was your state of mind? And what would you recommend for people yeah. to get yourself ready to do something creative like what you did? Okay. Let's go back to two products, the Apple One and the Apple Two. I did all the hardware, all the software myself. And the Apple One was not a computer design. It was not a Wozniak computer. I had a terminal. I had seen somebody on this thing called the ARPANET. The ARPANET stretched out to five or six computers. MIT, Stanford Research Institute, UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, University of Utah. And I saw them on it. And so, oh my gosh, I went home. I, I found a keyboard I could buy for $60, uppercase only. And I could run wires into my TV set already for Pong games and all that and get data on the TV. And I designed this little thing that I would type to a computer in Boston and it would type back to my TV in California. That was my television terminal. I didn't have any purpose for it, no business. Um, Steve Jobs was coming to town about once a year. He did turn that one into money, like all of them, because he had zero money. And, and I had this terminal, and we had the Homebrew Computer Club, and the microprocessor chip, I saw a spec sheet on it. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my gosh, these are like those little computers I taught myself to design, processors I taught myself to design in high school. Oh my God, my formula for owning my own computer that I told my dad I, someday I would own a computer and he said it costs as much as a house. I said, I'll live in an apartment. Is that the Moss? Now I saw my formula. What? Is that the Moss, the first chip? The Moss? Uh, well, I, I microprocessor. Well, anyway, I couldn't afford the Intel $400 microprocessor. Mm -hmm. 
single quantity. And I wanted to design my own computer. There were little kits called Altairs that were the Intel data sheet turned into hard parts. But they were like a computer I'd built five years before. Switches and lights for ones and zeros, button to get into memory. Um, I'd already built that computer. I'd been there the week that I met Steve Jobs even. And I, I wanted something human you could type in a program and get answers, solve problems. And that needed at least 4K of memory. It meant you had to use s dynamic memory to do it right. All these little startups were trying to use static memory. And, but the Apple One, I just took my terminal and I added a microprocessor and dynamic memory. And I, to get it refreshed, you have to keep giving sequential addresses to dynamic memory. To keep it refreshed, or it forgets everything. But I already had counters counting horizontal, vertical on the TV. I just grabbed one of those counts every so often and popped it into the RAM, and that took care of it. Okay, so I, so I had modified an existing terminal designed for the lowest price, the smallest parts, to work over slow telephone lines. It wasn't really designed as a computer from the ground up, but I went to the Homebrew Computer Club, and these were people that wanted to revolutionize the world. We used the word revolution. We wanted to bring computers to people, and I passed out my designs for free. No copyright notices, nothing. I just gave it away, said, here, for $300, you can build a useful computer with enough memory to have a programming language. And, and uh, then Steve Jobs came into town. <coughs> and it's not like that movie with Ashton Kushner, where he finds me in a basement working on a computer and hauls <laughs> me down to a club. I've been to the club every day since it started. I was a hero at the club, showing off my computers. Steve, Steve had never gone. He didn't. I took him to the club to show him what it was about. And, uh, and the, that was the Apple One. But yeah. before, and we, and you know, going into business, I would not risk my job at Hewlett Packard as an engineer. So I proposed it to them. And after enough turndowns, we were in business, and we had no money. And a local store wanted to buy fifty thousand dollars worth. Uh oh! And this, you know, Steve worked managed. We got the parts on thirty days credit. Yeah. Built the computers up in ten days. No lawyers and bureaucracy of management. And then we drove it down to the local store and got paid cash. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was that was how we organized the company with the Apple One. But before we ever delivered an Apple One, let me tell you another thing. I cared about education, young people, their upbringing. This is what's going to give you status in life. It's going to give you a home, a family someday. Is it your education? I drove Steve Jobs up for two hours up to Cotati, California, to see a woman who hauled a mini computer into elementary schools, huh. like where I had discovered this digital technology where nobody could. And she showed them how computers worked and talked about how they were programs written by humans. And oh, two hours driving back home, I tried to talk Steve Jobs into giving Liza Lowe up the first Apple I computer. Uh. And he wouldn't do it. He made me buy it for $300 and give it to her, and I did. Uh. The very first Apple I, she still has it. <laughs> but I believed that. But before we ever shipped this Apple I computer, I, had, I was showing off my Apple II computer. The color machine, the arcade machine, incredible shrinkage of parts and in, in increase in performance. This was a machine that was so expandable, expandable, lots of slots you could plug new ideas into, new hardware for different things you came up with, you know, sensors for equipment, um, floppy disk drives, other things. You could plug more memory into it. It was so expandable. And everybody else thought, well, no, you just want to make the absolute cheapest, cheapest, cheapest thing you can, Commodore and Radio Shack kind of jumped in the market. Of course, Commodore, before they jumped in, they came to the garage. Mm -hmm. Chuck Peddle came to the garage. I demonstrated all the Apple II and what it would do. I had to type in a few commands and draw color swirls on the screen and, and little after dark type displays. It was an impressive demonstration. I even got to show it to Intel staff one day, long before we had the Apple II out as a product. And Chuck Peddle looked at it and said, he went back to Commodore. He wanted to do his own thing. He wanted to be his, in mm. charge of his own product. Mm. Went to Commodore and said, no, no, no. People just want a chiclet keyboard. And they want a little black and white screen, uh -huh. very minimal. They don't want graphics. They don't want all this neat stuff. They don't want expandability. They don't want to add, you buy it with 4K RAM, and you don't want slots to add more because slots cost money. And well, he was kind of wrong because the head of engineering at Commodore eventually came to Apple and said, <laughs> we have the right product. Um, anyway, where am I? Oh, I was asking about Apple you know, the state of so mind. So the Apple II, we had two starts of Apple. The state of mind was yeah. I wanted my own computer, and I had a formula, and I was ahead of almost anyone in the world for, an af for affordability and usefulness. Mm -hmm. 
and I just want to show it off. And uh, that's what I've done with all my little technology projects in my life that weren't worth money. The Apple II, though, was a strange one. I didn't give it away for free at the Homebrew Computer Club. Mm -hmm. This one, even my engineer friends at Hewlett Packard said, this is going to be a great product. Mm. And I love the games. I had designed Breakout for Atari, where you hit the ball against the bricks. It's a black and white game mm -hmm. back then in the arcades. And I wrote it in one day, actually 30 minutes. I wrote it in color, in basic, on my own computer. Called Steve Jobs over. I was shaking. I was shaking. And so was he, I think. Over, you, you could just change some number, one little number, and the color of the bricks would change. It was that simple? Tiny little program. Oh. I wrote, I did write, um, <coughs> being an engineer, I did write a version of my, my uh, breakout game. It was in color on the Apple II computer. I did write a version, if you hit Control Z, it went into a mode where the, pa the paddle jiggled and jiggled, but never missed the ball. Oh. So that somebody would think they were playing and never lose it. I took it down to the Homebrew Computer Club and let one person play it who'd never really played these video games, and he won the game. <laughs> he didn't realize it was playing itself. <laughs> but anyway, um, my state of mind was, it's a lot of, this is a lot of fun in the world, and it's neat to show off, and it's useful for games, but I have my own little, I have, you know, puzzle comes up. I want to write my own pro program to solve it. At work, Hewlett Packard, we had one big mini computer shared by all the engineers. Now I had my own little computer on my desk, mm -hmm. and I could run my own simulations of my logic designs in for chips. I could run my own simulations on my own computer mm -hmm. without waiting. I mean, it, so it was actually my work machine as well as my fun machine. So it was kind of you built something you wanted to have. Oh, totally. Yeah, totally. This yeah. is exactly built it for myself, what right. I wanted to have. Secondarily, I wanted to show it off and impress people about my, my uh, engineering abilities. Uh, okay. So um, there's a lot of technology things going on now. There's, uh, uh, and I understand you have some concerns about some of the things that are happening. Maybe it's uh, where AI is going to go. Can you talk a little bit about uh, okay, limitations sure. of technology? I read an article just a couple days ago, and it mentioned <coughs> how the, the Gutenberg press, the press, was changing the world. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of thankful for Apple being that way a bit, too. Privacy and human rights. Mm -hmm. You've heard of the EFF, Electronic Frontier Foundation. And I was one of the founders and on the first board of that company. Mm -hmm. I only left the board once we got, um, oh, what do you call those guys in Washington that sit down with politicians? Lobbyists. Lobbyists. Yeah. Once we got a lobbyist, well, that's politics. And I was going to be engineering my whole life, not law, not politics. Mm. So that's when I left the board. But, yeah. Mm. Okay. But that was that, uh, just important. My, I still have a lot of my opinions. Mm -hmm. I'm not political, but a lot of my opinions go towards, you know, Human rights, the human should always be more important mm -hmm. than, than even governments. The guy with nothing mm -hmm. should be as important as the guy with wealth and power. And I'm always, you know, trying to fight those fights. Sure, sure. Um, are, th are there particular things that you're worried about in terms of where technology can go or, you know, kind of the ethics of things we do as engineers? Maybe? Well, ethics is honesty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, well, a lot of it can disappear, but not in technology. Mm -hmm. The technology is pure. Mm -hmm. It's the people behind it that get control of it. The use of it that use it to, you know, basically not give us as much choice. Mm. To me, anything you have in life, choice equals money. For example, let's say you're going to hire somebody, but they live too far away, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a long drive for them. Oh, we'll just pay you enough to have a limousine take you or a bus, and you can do your work on the way. And there are solutions you can come up with. Mm. The more choices you have, mm -hmm. the more you – that's really freedom in life. Okay. And, the, and a lot of our choices – really disappear, and we don't even notice it all that much. But, um, uh, you know, if somebody's just being dishonest with me, all my life I had a formula that life is not about success. Mm -hmm. It's not about how much money you make. It's not about starting companies. It's about how you feel, mm -hmm. smiling versus frowning. So I mm -hmm. came up with a formula, formula yeah, yeah. in those personality-forming days, so it would stick with me forever that life was about happiness. It was after I read an article in some magazine about Sumner Redstone and Viacom and trading $50 million companies and all this big time stuff. And I said, you know, I just want to be an average normal person in the middle having a lot of fun. So my formula was H equals S minus F. Happiness equals smiles minus frowns. <laughs> Play jokes and pranks, being creative, creating anything, a program really brings a lot of smiles.
How do you avoid frowns? One thing is just be constructive. Mm -hmm. My car gets dented. Don't look to blame others. Don't be judgmental. Mm -hmm. Don't look for a cause, a problem to be sad about. Just say, hey, a car got dented. Cars get dented. Mm -hmm. Let's be constructive and go get it fixed. <laughs> and also I learned you don't argue with people. Mm -hmm. Don't argue. You've got a line of thinking. A connects to B, connects to C, connects to D. See this. And, and if somebody doesn't agree, you walk away and you're frowning. Mm -hmm. So don't feel I have to win things. I don't have to take sides. Don't be, it's a non-conflict mode of thinking that I have. So happiness equals smiles minus frowns. <laughs> it, stop the things that give you frowns. But I, I came up with a slightly var a variation of that formula in later years. Hmm. H equals F cubed. Happiness equals food, which is the metaphor for the necessities of life, to be happy. Mm -hmm. Food, fun, and friends, three things, uh. three elements. And I was being inducted into my high school hall of fame. The students started laughing when I said that. Mm. I had to, real embarrassingly, I had to go on the microphone and say, well, there might be a fourth F. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> sense, sense, sense of humor and honesty are the two, two keys uh, yeah. that I applied to technology as well as my life. Oh, very good. Um, so, um, what kind of things are you thinking of doing in 2020? Uh, what's, uh, what's, what's this year have in store for you? Or the next decade, even? We're in a new you decade know, now. Well, a long time ago, I remember when I was flying and I thought my life was starting to get real busy because of Apple. I thought if you don't have enough time, hundreds of hours to up your rating to twin engine and instrument and jets and all that, then, you know, it's not worth just flying your friends off to have lunch once in a while when I'm 50 years old and I have all the time in the world. It doesn't happen that way in life. So um, I've always been, I guess, very work-minded. And, um, and I, I worked hard. I taught, I taught for eight years of my life to elementary schools in the public schools. No press allowed near students. I wouldn't allow it. And I taught how to use the computer for everything in school 200 hours per year. These students, these young students, 11-year-olds, they earn their computer. And then I started teaching seventh to ninth graders. I got up to seven days a week of classes. It was that important in my life. You work on it a lot. And, but I get through things. And I don't want to go back there. Don't need to go back there. It was exciting for kids to own a computer back then. Their course was good. Well, now I have um, education and technology have been par big parts of my life. And you might have heard of Was U a technical yep. online university, largely online, but partly in facilities all across the nation. It's expanding across the world now. And that's run out of Phoenix, so I'm involved in a business that way. I also, um, and I, I, I gave away all my money to museums and things like that because I really didn't want that sort of wealth. You know, having a street named after me in San Jose is worth more. Um, you know, for a, a lot, and a lot of great museums that I helped start. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I got there, and then I did this education. You're giving a lot of computers to schools, and I said, if you have a ton of money, eh, giving it away, that's just Nick Nichols and Dimes. It doesn't say it's a sacrifice in your heart, but I'd always wanted to be a teacher. That's why I did my teaching for eight years of my life. Um, incredible, an incredible amount of my time. Right now, we've got WASU, which is education and technology. I'm involved in a couple of blockchain efforts. I don't want to start a new digital currency. Bitcoin is gold. It's pretty amazing how, de how it could be decentralized and last as long as it is and not have bugs and problems and all that. But if you have a company that's earning a lot of money, a lot of revenue already, then using a blockchain is another method of finance and it's just like stock. A blockchain, a token, a blockchain token can be like stock in a company that has a good value and it's not lost. So I'm involved in a couple of those on a couple of stock exchanges that are opening up to blockchain tokens on their stock exchange. Mm -hmm. One's in Gibraltar, one's in Malta. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I, oh, I've also been involved in putting on Silicon Valley Comic Con. Oh, that's right, yeah. Need I explain more? You can miss Stan Lee, I'll bet. Yeah, and then I, yeah. but I've been speaking an awful lot too. Public speaking became a big part of my life. You know, a friend of mine, a well-known hacker named Kevin Mitnick, was phoning me like at 2 in the morning. And he's in Moscow. And he phoned me. I'm in Prague. I'm ph he's phoned me. He's in Bogota. I said, I'm kind of jealous you're getting all over the world. I haven't used a passport in 10 years. Reasons for, there's reasons for that, too. I got sick and tired of travel. 
I said, this is kind of interesting. You're going to all these places. He says, oh, I give speeches. I'll introduce you to my speech agent. Oh, and so I met her, and I said, okay, book me speeches. Fine. I started speaking mm. publicly, mm -hmm. and it got up to where I was doing 100 a year, mostly foreign, mm. and got up to, you know, even very high pay for it. So I'm constantly traveling, 200 mm. airplane flights a year, mm. and now I'm trying to cut way back because of family. Right. My family is four little dogs mainly. <laughs> <laughs> have to worry about. They don't understand why daddy goes. <laughs> so the speaking is kind of curtailing down, but starting some of these businesses will maybe click in. We'll see. I, uh, I believe all of you still want to have, uh, have some more, many questions. If uh, you are uh, have the same age as me, you you, you can, uh, and uh, you also use the Apple II and the Macintosh. Uh, it's a quite ama amazing machine. Uh, as I am a fellow committee member to review the application of Steve, I'm very surprised why he did not apply before. So uh, for the other committee member, agree, and uh, Steve would be the best one in our society. So finally he can get the, this award, yeah. Congratulations. Yes, I... We got home from a cruise the other night. <clears throat> we had one hour at home before we had to drive and leave to Las Vegas through the night. And before going, I noticed in the mail, I had my fellowship, my fellowship document and pin. I forgot to bring them though. <laughs> Thanks, have a good day.